All right, good morning, church. So good, so good to be here with you guys today. I want you to stand and worship with me.
There's a sling in my voice and a stone in my praise. Pushing back where the darkest weapons fall. There's a power on my lips, even death can defy. When the name of our God is lifted high, amen. Cause there is resurrection power when we sing the name of Jesus. Resurrection power when we raise a mighty sound. So come on, let your praise get loud. Let that empty grave resound. Cause there is resurrection power in his name there were days i have seen filled with heartache and loss that have buried my heart beneath their weight but every time his praise breaks out dead things rise up from the ground i won't leave my song inside that empty Amen. There's resurrection power in this room this morning. Y'all sing this out with me. We're going to let go of those chains. We're walking out of that grave. Come on. Dead man, come out of that grave. Come out of that grave when we sing captives. Let go of those chains. Let go of those chains when we praise dead man. Come out of that grave. Come out of that grave when we Sing captives, let go of those chains, let go of those chains when we praise dead men. Come out of that grave, come out of that grave when we sing captives, let go of those chains, let go of those chains when we praise dead men. Come out of that grave, come out of that grave when we sing captives. Let go of those chains, let go of those chains Cause there is resurrection power When we sing the name of Jesus Resurrection power When we raise a mighty sound So come on, let your praise get loud Make that empty grave resound Cause there is resurrection power In His name
what you can do, oh God of wonders, your power has no end. The things you've done before in greater measure, you will do again. There's no prison wall you can break through, no mountain you can move, all things are possible. There's no broken body you can raise, no soul that you can save, all things are possible. The darkest night you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome, you've already won, oh God of revival, you rose in victory. Now you're seated forever on the throne. So why should my heart fear what you've defeated? I will trust.
You are the God of revival and you can revive this place. God, you can revive our hearts, our marriages, our commitment to follow you. God, we all need revival. You are the God of this city. You're the God of the people in this room. God, we want to be the church for this city. We want to be used by you, God, to make a difference in every heart and every life in this room. So God, would you fill this place? Would you give Pastor Jeremy the words to speak this morning? And just touch our hearts. We love you. We bless you in your name we pray. Good morning. Uh, so, as you notice, you are not hearing Pastor Chris this morning. Um, just to introduce myself and just to kind of call myself out, I am very nervous for this. But hey, um, said a prayer this morning. Just hope that the words that I have to speak uh, can speak to everybody here. I hope that th what I've learned over these last couple weeks and the message I'm going to be sharing uh, can change somebody out there. Uh, but so who am I? So Pastor Chris said, uh, my name is Jeremy Dennis. Uh, my wife, Stephanie, and I, we get to be the youth pastors here at the church uh, for the last couple of years. Yeah, so just to talk about that for a minute, uh, she could probably agree with me and say that uh, that's probably been one of the biggest blessings in our life and our marriage. Uh, it has completely changed us, just the opportunity uh, to get to speak to the youth uh, every week, just to talk to them about life. Uh, that is something that I personally did not have growing up. I didn't have that group that I got to go to, get, got to fellowship with. I didn't really have a youth pastor that I could go to for advice. Uh, so just to get that has been an honor and a privilege for us. Uh, we have learned a lot with them. Uh, we have grown a lot of relationships with them. Uh, it's very, like I said, it's been very ben uh, beneficial to us. Uh, it's allowed an opportunity for uh, me personally just to get real with them, to be honest with the youth group. Uh, and to be honest and real right now, this has been, it was really hard for me to, uh, to gather myself to come up here to, to get this message together, uh, really because I was facing a lot of inner demons, if you want to call it that. Uh, I had a lot of fear inside of me. I had a lot of self-doubt. Uh, I was telling myself, you know, you're not good enough. You know, you can't do this. You know, you're just, you just talk to youth on a weekly basis. How can you gather the, the knowledge and the words to say to go talk to adults? Uh, so I was battling with that, and I was trying to figure out, you know, which story I wanted to do when Pastor Chris approached us with this summer story series. Uh, and it wasn't, I was in my truck coming uh, home from work one day, and I was sitting there thinking to myself, really just questioning, you know, why do I have this self-doubt? Why was I having this fear inside of me? Uh, and this story came to mind. Uh, as a kid, I'm pretty sure a lot of teenagers can relate to this. I love playing with fire. But there's something on the opposite side of the fire. You'll get burned. Uh, so I kind of had uh, some coming to that when I was a teenager, when I was a kid. Uh, so that story kind of came to me, and I was thinking of, I remember when I was little going to, to my grandparents' church and hearing my, my grandfather preach on stage about this story. Um, and it was the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, so the story of how these three men, I'm going to get to it in a second, uh, they were thrown into this fiery furnace, and they, be, they came out on the other side unsinged. They weren't burned. Uh, and so this story really stuck with me, and really the part of how we can have I was challenging myself how I can approach this fear, this self-doubt, uh, and have faith. How I can trust in God and have faith that he's going to get me through this situation, uh, get me through this morning. Uh, and I'm standing here, so I guess he, he's doing something good. Um, so again, so this story came to me, and if I had to give a title to it and how it's been speaking to me over these last couple weeks, uh, like I said, it's just faith over fear. Uh, and I really want to center around this idea of commitment. What does commitment look like in us? And, and that's what's been challenged. I challenge myself and really ask my own personal walk with Christ, what does my commitment look like? Um, 
So we're going to be in Daniel chapter 3 this morning. Uh, bear with me. I am going to go through the full chapter. It's only 30 verses. Uh, but, so hey, so we're going to do a lot of reading this morning, and I'll take a couple of pauses just to kind of speak to you all about how this chapter has spoke to me and what God has laid upon me. Uh, if anything out of this, my goal is just that you all can, hopefully what I've learned from this uh, can cascade down to you all and you all can learn uh, something as well. So we'll be in Daniel chapter 3. I'll be reading from the ESV version. So it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and a breadth of 6 cubits. Fun fact right there. Uh, if you do not know what a cubic is, a cubic is equivalent to about a foot and a half. So this object of gold would have been about 90 feet tall by 6 foot wide. Uh, so just kind of put that in your head about how big this, this object was, this idol. So he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. The king Nebuchadnezzar uh, sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, uh, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the providences to come to the dedication of the image that king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 3 says, Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the providences gathered to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they heard, and the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship this golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whosoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, uh, the trigon, the harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, uh, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made it a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace, and who is the God who would deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So stopping right there, uh, the first thought I had on this passage, and my main point, is that they were willing to pay the price of their commitment. Uh, so I want to pause, really just look at that one word, commitment. Uh, and I really started asking myself, so I want to ask you all a question, uh, and as who in here has commitments? Who has commitments? Come on. I need some help here. Uh, yeah, so we all have commitments. You know, I personally have a lot of commitments. Uh, but I kind of started asking myself, do we really understand what is a commitment? What does a commitment mean? What does a commitment look like? Uh, so I went to good old Webster, and I pulled a definition for this. So the, a commitment is defined as the state or quality of being dedicated to a cause or activity, et cetera. Dedication, that word right there, dedication. What are you dedicated to? And what does dedication look like? Um, dedication, it takes time. If you're dedicated to something, you're going to spend your time into it. You're going to spend your energy. You're going to even probably make some sacrifices. Uh, and me personally, I have a lot of commitments uh, pretty much on a daily basis. If I'm committed to my family, uh, I make 
sacrifices for them. I have to go out and work, and I have commitments to my work. I have commitments to church, being here on Sundays and Wednesdays and getting lessons together for the youth. Uh, commitments to personal things that I just loved doing, which is playing drums. If I didn't commit myself to that, if I didn't take the dedication to learn it, Y'all probably wouldn't want me on that stage. Uh, and also video games. I love playing video games. That's something that I dedicate my time to. I de dedicate my energy to. I make sacrifices to not be with my family certain times to play video games. Uh, I'm pretty sure she would rather me not do that. Uh, but that's stuff I personally enjoy doing. So uh, really a question I started asking myself is, am I displaying the same commitment that I display to all these personal commitments? Do I have that same commitment to God? And I think we all need to ask ourselves this is, are we displaying that same commitment, that same level on our walk with God? Are we spending that time? Are we spending that energy? Are we making sacrifices for God? Are we doing this on a daily basis? You know, and we see this with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were staring death in the face. The king was already told them that, hey, if you do not worship my God, if you don't bow before my idol, you are going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And they did not waver. They stayed strong in their faith. They were committed to God. Throughout everything, they, even what that price was for their faith in Jesus, they still stood strong in their faith to follow Christ. So, we align ourselves with God. Let's say we make this commitment. Easy street, right? You know, hey, we commit ourselves to God. Every day is going to be so perfect. It's going to be great. Uh, I was going to wear my shirt, no perfect people allowed. But uh, just, just, so everything is, it just aligns itself. That's not true. Um, but what happens there is when you commit your life to Christ, you place a target on your head. Uh, Chris talked about this past week how there's an enemy out there, Satan, who only, his only objective is to still kill and destroy us. When we commit ourselves to God, you have now placed a target on your head, and the enemy is out to get you. His, his only goal is to, when you start to commit yourself to Christ, you start growing these roots down deep and you're following Christ daily. His only goal is to poison those roots, to uproot you and to steer you away from Christ. But what we must do, we must remain steadfast. We must remain firm in our commitment to Christ. Are we remaining firm to God? Are we staying in his word daily? If we place ourselves on a spectrum, uh, if, you place, if you have a one on one side and a ten on the other, one, eh, you know who God is. Five, you show up to church. Or are you 10 out of 10? Are you all in committed to Christ every day? Luke 9.23 says that if anyone desires, himself, desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That word right there, daily. Doesn't say take up your cross and follow him on my Sundays. Doesn't say follow him just on Wednesdays. But you have to do that daily. That is a commitment that we have made to Christ, and that is him commanding us to follow him daily. It must extend past Sundays and must extend past Wednesdays. And backtracking to kind of where the king has found himself right here, you know, he's created this idol. He's commanded people to bow down and worship this idol. First John 5.21 says, that little children keep yourself from idols. You know, growing up, we all have heard the Ten Commandments, and the first commandment says, Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. If we commit ourselves to Christ, we've heard this commandment. We've heard this. Of course, it seems like the king is completely disobeying this. And then Jonah 2.8 says that those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. So this is where this king has found himself in. He's, he's fallen these idols. He's completely abandoned the love of God. He has abandoned the steadfast love of God. And then looking at kind of where these three are, they've, you know, they're, they're facing death. They're facing the fiery furnace for following God. And it had me thinking, I was like, you know, it's one thing that this was actually just all history and we didn't have this. We didn't face this today. Uh, of course, we don't face a furnace, but there are still people today that are persecuted for their faith in Jesus. Um, and luckily, it kind of had me thinking. I was like, you know, I'm so glad that we live in a nation where we get to practice our First Amendment, that we have a freedom of religion. Uh, but others do not have that same freedom. I want to share some statistics with y'all. Um, there was a, this was according to the Open Doors World Watch List of 2022. So this was comparing 2020 uh, to 2021, uh, and this was worldwide. So it says Christians last year, so in 2020, 
2021, more Christians were detained or killed for their faith, and more churches were attacked or closed than the year before. And of course, we saw COVID. COVID hit, the enemy struck, uh, and a lot of churches closed down because of this. We've seen churches attacked on the media. We've seen shooters walk in killing Christians. And of course, across the world, we've seen a lot of Christians in hiding. They're still in hiding. Uh, People have to hide away so the government can't see them worshiping God. And it says that Christians were detained or killed for their faith, and more churches were attacked or closed the year before. In the past year, 360 million Christians, or one in seven believers around the world, suffered significant persecution for their faith. That's not just death, that's just persecution. So they were persecuted for their faith in Christ. But each day in 2021, an average of more than 16 believers were killed for their faith in Jesus. If you do that math, 365 days a year, that brings that number to roughly 5,840 Christians were killed for their faith in Jesus. 2021 itself saw a 24 increase of Christians being killed. Is that not to wake us up? We have a freedom here to worship God. Are we taking advantage of this? Are we just living a day like, eh, I trust Jesus? Are we really all in? Are we willing to pay that price of our commitment? Are we willing to work to serve God, not just, like I said, on Sundays and Wednesday? Are we willing to serve God daily? Are we walking with him daily? Jesus also speaks about, you know, this isn't for nothing. You know, us taking this walk with God on a daily basis. I mean, there's a reward on the other side. Uh, On Matthew 5, 12, it says to rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For so so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This isn't for nothing. We're not just walking this earth and learning about this man and there's nothing on the other side. But we have an eternity with Christ if we commit ourselves to him daily. Are we committed? Are we committed to Christ? What does that look like? Picking back up in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 19, this is probably one of my favorite parts of this passage, uh, but it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Another fun fact, uh, that on average a furnace uh, is usually heated anywhere between 1,800 and 2,000 degrees. That's the average temp of a furnace. Uh, Seven times that would have placed this temperature anywhere between 1,200, I'm sorry, 12,600 uh, and 14,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Y'all think it's hot right now? <laughs> That's hot. Uh, and so picking back up, it says, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. These men uh, were bound in their cloaks and their tunics and their hats and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's orders was urgent and the furnace was overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and their appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. My second point is that God will always follow through with his commitments to us. Beyond their commitment, beyond their their daily commitment to God, they trusted that God was with them. They knew that no matter what that outcome was, if they were cast into this furnace, that God was going to be present with them because God upholds his commitment. We have our commitment to him, God's going to uphold his. John 15, 7 says that if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. If we trust in Jesus, if we walk in him and we take his words and we hide them in our heart daily, God's going to uphold his faith, his commitment to us. All we have to do is have just a little bit of faith. Trust in Jesus. Walk with him. Anything is possible. It doesn't say just a little bit. Abide in me and anything can be done for you. And what that reminds me, especially in my situation over these last couple of weeks, as I was trying to gather the strength and the faith to, to talk about God up on the stage, uh, it's no matter what we go through, no matter what fire you're in, Uh, We all have different situations that we walk through in life. You might be going through a whole different fire right now than your neighbor. God is not going to forsake you. God is there with you in the fire despite your circumstances. You will never walk through the fire alone. 
But it's not until, like I said, we start to live up to our commitments to Christ, we have to make that first step. We have to call upon God. We have to receive him and walk with him daily. We have to trust in Jesus to really see that commitment. Because if we're not following Jesus every day, we're not going to understand the commitments that he has to us because we're not in his word. You have to trust Jesus. And to develop that faith, you have to be fully committed to Christ. It starts with us. Picking back up in Daniel chapter 3 and 26. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from, from the fire. And the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair on their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. And no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except for their own. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language that speaks against anything that God, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be torn from limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the providence of Babylon. Third point is that our faith and commitment, you know, we just got done talking in, uh, about this previous series about how our, our sins can have ripple effect through generations. In that same sense, though, your faith and your commitment can have a ripple effect around you. When people see that faith that you have in Christ, when people see that daily commitment, you can lead people to Christ. Because of their faith and commitment to Jesus, King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he saw God's love right here. He saw that steadfast love that he, was, he, that he completely steered away from when he had brought up this idol. He began to have a change of heart right here. He began to say that this love of God, that this commitment that they had in him, he saw this love and that God was with them through the fire. And what's so crazy is that we have that same power living within us. When we commit ourselves to God, when we have that faith in Jesus, we have the power to overcome the thoughts. We have that power to overcome the temptations. When the devil speaks in your mind, he tells you, you're not good for that. You can't do that. No one's going to listen to you. You never know who's watching, though, and the impact that you can have around those, those around you when you just commit yourself to God 100%. Matthew 17, 20 says that because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard, um, mustard seed, that you will say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So all it takes is a little bit of faith. Anything is possible. Just have a little bit of faith in God, and you can walk through any fire that approaches you. Again, are we committed? Are we committed to God? And our faith, our, our faith has the power not only to change, but the world around us, the people around you. It can have a change within your family. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, being involved in this, y'all have heard about I Am For, y'all have heard about the Become a Man movement. Uh, this has completely changed my, my life. Uh, it's given me a new perspective that, uh, on how to be a prophet, a, a priest, a king, and a warrior in my family, uh, and that I have kids looking up to me. I have a wife that's looking up to me. Um, and it challenges my commitment. It challenges my faith in Christ. Am I really, truly staying in the Word daily? Am I following after Christ? Am I living up to how He has commanded me to be? And if you've not gotten involved in that movement, every man in this room, every teenager, get involved. It will completely change your life. Uh, Again, God has called us to be a prophet, priest, king, and a warrior. He has called us to be fully committed to Him. He has called us to have a faith in Him. So, as I wrap up, just a key takeaway from this whole thing, what has changed me over these last couple, uh, couple weeks, uh, it starts with us, that commitment starts with us. We have to first establish that commitment in Christ and understand that it's a daily commitment. It doesn't just happen, like I said, Sundays and Wednesdays. We have to walk with Christ daily. Once we are in that word daily, we then can see God's commitment to us, that no matter what trial you're gonna go through, no matter what fire you're gonna walk through, that God is right there with you in every circumstance. And when we do that, when we fully commit ourselves to Christ, the world around us, our families can see that within us. And we can also make a change within them. 
And when fear strikes, when those words of temptation come, there's no, without a doubt that we can shoot that down and understand that's the words of the enemy. That is not the words of God. That's not the words of the king. Remember that you are never alone in a fire. And so I'll just want that to be our prayer today. Uh, if y'all would please stand with me. God, as we come to you this morning, we just want to thank you. Uh, we want to thank you for sending your son, not only to pay the price of our sins, Lord, uh, but to set that perfect example of what a commitment looks like. God, through your promises and, and through your word, we know that we will never be alone, and we thank you for that, God. We ask that you make us living examples of what it means to be fully committed to you daily so that we may reach the world around us and reach our families, Lord. And if we have not already, God, I ask that you just teach us to create and maintain daily holy habits. God, I pray that if there is anyone in this room that does not know you, that they will have the courage to make the first steps and trust in you, Lord. I pray that this just plants a seed in their heart. God, I also ask that as we go into this next week that you will use everyone on this campus, you use every volunteer, every student that walks through these doors, and you would change their hearts in VBS. God, we love you and we praise you and ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.